I'm just here to tell you about an experiment that's going on at MIT. It's a collaboration between uh, Misha's group and Modin's group. Um, and I don't. So um, the motivation for my talk is uh, it's, it's sort of a story about technology. And uh, really, to start that story, I want to talk about conventional technology, a purple of conventional technological component, i.e. a resistor. It's a really simple example. And uh, you know, resistors obey simple rules. They, they obey something like Ohm's law of equals IR. You know, the, the resistor is characterized by a single number R. Um, and, and we sort of think we know how it behaves when that happens. But we also know intuitively that reality is complex. And that R is not necessarily just one simple number. Um, that R actually couples to the environment. Um, it couples to temperature and pressure. Um, and uh, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's not just R. But, but the truth is, um, that usually doesn't matter. Uh, most of the time, we can minimize that coupling, or we can you know, operate with circuits that use these resistors that it doesn't really matter um, if the value changes by a bit. Um, so, but sometimes it matters. Um, sometimes it, it matters in uh, cases where you really need good resistors, and these are some of the most interesting and important cases in science. Um, so one example is like precise sensing with resistors. So resistors make good current sensors. Resistors make good thermometers. Um, but if your resistor is somehow coupled to its environment, then that resistance is changing, and you don't really, you don't really get good sensing. Um, similarly, metrology, the idea of defining an ohm, um, you, you can't really have a physical realization of an ohm that is somehow also coupled to its environment, varies with pressure and temperature. Um, it's just, it's not a good metrological standard. And this is, this is actually a, a real kind of, this is the quantum ohm uh, from PTB, uh, where they actually realize uh, that ohm. So, uh, you know, the most ideal scenario is if you somehow had a material or a property that just didn't even care about these fluctuations. It had no effect whatsoever. Um, and, and quantum mechanics occasionally can give us things like this. Um, a good example is uh, the integer quantum Hall effect. So in this case, um, the <coughs> semiconductor is a magnetic field in the plane of that semiconductor. And uh, you know, what we find is that the resistance, transverse resistance, in the semiconductor is robust. Its, its resistance is just Planck's constant divided by the electron charge squared, and n is, is some integer. Right, and this, this doesn't depend on temperature. I think these are constants, right? Constants and one integer. Um, so, so this is this is a robust uh, resistance. It's it's you know when it's prepared correctly, it's insensitive to you know fluctuations in temperature. Maybe not gigantic ones, but um, and also it's it's actually insensitive to disorder. You know, this thing could have cracks on the edges. It can have you know crud inside the the material itself, and you still get the same number. It's, fascinating. Um, and the reason is because this is protected by topology. So there's this mathematical property, it's topology. I don't need to go into what that is right now because it's not relevant for the rest of the talk. But um, this robustness comes from this mathematical property that, that protects it. And so um, this is a theme that's going to come back later. The idea that we have you know, protection by some mathematical property, and from that we get robustness, right? And uh, and actually, this this is useful because this is in fact the quantum Ohm standard. The quantum Ohm standard is based on the integer quantum Hall effect. So that standard I showed you in the previous slide, that is that that's what this is. Um, so one great example of a reason to care about you know this protected stuff, aside from you know better resistors is that uh, is this idea of a topological quantum computer. So this is still just theoretical, um, but the idea is that you know we have some plane, some wafer or whatever, and there's there's anions in it. These anions change places, right? And we get a phase shift from their places changing. This is braided. And you know, if the kind of as they change places, if there's some fluctuation, it doesn't matter. We just have to change places. So this is robust. It's stable, and it's topology that's protecting it. 
And the fact that it's stable means that you know, it's, it's a good quantum computer. Quantum computers, we can care a lot about things like decoherence, coupling to the environment, and that robustness helps that. So theoretically, it's better. No one's ever realized it yet. Um, so we tried, we're looking for effects like these. We try to look for effects like these in our system. And, um, and I'll just tell you about our system so that I can tell you, you know, tell you, tell you how we did these effects and, and the context of all that. So, um, so what we study is actually photon level optical nonlinearities. Um, this, is, this is a whole field. And basically, um, the reason why one would care about photon level uh, optical nonlinearities, well, there, there's a number of reasons. Uh, this paper is just one example, but there are numerous examples. Um, in 95, uh, Chuang and Yamamoto showed that uh, if you had a single photon level optical nonlinearity that was strong, you could get a, you know, a gate for photons, a good quantum gate for photons. And uh, this could be used for like gates on flying qubits and quantum networks. Um, and also, actually, uh, these photon level optical nonlinearities, one could have a, uh, one could realize exotic states of light that are of fundamental interest. So things like um, photonic molecules or uh, photonic crystallization. Um, and then, uh, and also photonic devices like quantum switches or a quantum you know, light transistor. Um, now, the, uh, the basic idea about nonlinearities and optical nonlinearities, when you think about them on the single photon level, is it's really just that a nonlinearity is interactions between photons. That's all it is. And um, so the key challenge here, when you want to make photons interact, is that in free space, they, they don't really interact. The interactions are negligibly small. Um, and in conventional materials where you get photons kind of interacting, you get these like you know, nonlinear crystals for things like second harmonic generation, um, those are far too weak to see these kinds of effects on a single photon level. Um, so there are different approaches to realizing strong single photon level um, interactions. This is what we do. Um, so basically, uh, there are two ingredients. The first one is the photons are coupled to atoms. So this is an ultra-cold gas of atoms. And they're coupled to the atoms through slow light techniques. And then the next ingredient is that the atoms are coupled together with Rydberg interactions. Um, and, uh, and so these are strong interactions between atoms. right? And the, the combination of that is a mediated interaction between photons. Right? And this, this can be very large. So um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about the EIT part. So uh, basically, we have a dense gas per billion, right? So we just focus the laser through that dense gas. Um, and so we scan our laser across you know, some resonance, and we see really strong absorption, right? absorption in the transmission of the light through that gas, because the gas is so dense. Right? And then you add a second laser, this control laser. It's a strong laser, right? This is non-perturbative. And uh, we'll have, you know, if I want to drive this GDE transition, and I have one amplitude to go from GE, I have another amplitude to go from GE to S and E again. It's kind of that stable state up here. And those can cancel. Um, and so this, this medium can actually look transparent um, kind of on this resonance. And so if we think about this in the context of pulses, right, our experiment um, uses pulses. So we need to talk about this in terms of pulses. Right? So, so this control laser here, this thing that couples this, this excited state to this metastable state, uh, that's constant. You just think of that as constant on all the time CW, and that's going to be the case for all the experiments I'm going to talk about um, you know, from here on. And then we send pulses in on this probe transition. Right? So basically, you know, this probe uh, in free space will have a speed C. It'll enter this medium, right? And uh, when it does, it's no longer a photon. It's a polarity. Um, it, it has two components, right? One is uh, sort of a photonic excitation. A spin wave excitation, and the superposition of those two that kind of describes this, this state. And uh, these mixing angles right, depend on you know, the velocity of, the, uh, of the, the photon in this medium, right, which kind of is related to the, the coupling here, and, and also G, which is actually the coupling between a photon and an atom. And uh, you know, in our case, that's, that's 400 meters a second. And the kind of the simple way to think of this. 
uh, reduced group velocity is that the, the photon has a speed of c, the spin wave has a speed of zero, and the polariton's kind of in the middle, depending on how much of the photon part it has and how much of the spin wave part it has. So uh, now then that second ingredient, um, the Rydberg states, uh, now I'm going to add that in. Okay, so we have, our, we have our EIT, but now this metastable state is a Rydberg state. In many of our experiments, this 100S state. And so um, the idea is that if, if one atom is in the 100S Rydberg state, and one is in its ground state, and you know, these two EIT lasers are kind of shined on these atoms, if they're far apart, then they just act like independent atoms. But when they get close together, this interaction energy will actually shift this 100S resonance you know, so far that now EIT is actually destroyed for this, for this atom. And, uh, and so you know, there, there's no longer EIT conditions here. It's really just the two-level atom response in that case. And this happens you know, with the familiar blockade radius, where in this case, right, it's when the interaction energy at you know, some distance, the blockade radius is equal to the EIT limit. This, uh, here's some early Early papers about Rydberg EIT and then um, some of the early theory about the Rydberg blockade that Cote Luke and Sorax and other. Um, so, just to give you a simple picture of how uh, this system gives you a photon scale nonlinearity. So, imagine we have you know, our medium of dense rubidium and we send a single photon in, a single photon pulse, right through this medium. Well, we have EIT because I you know, assume this control laser is on the whole time. So this pulse goes straight through. It's just high transmission. It's EIT. That's what EIT does. Right? But now with two pulses, when they're within a blockade radius of each other, then the EIT condition no longer really holds. That interaction energy really kind of messes it up. And so at this point, there's really strong absorption because it's just this two-level you know, response. And so this is the nonlinearity. You, you have a really strong qualitative difference between one and two photons. One transmit, two you have really strong absorption. Uh, but, okay, so, uh, so here's our apparatus. Uh, it's a Rubidium 87 Ma trapped in a cross optical dipole trap. And then uh, our probe laser, that probe beam is focused to you know, a wave that's smaller than the Rydberg blockade radius, so we get a, you know, an effective 1D system. And then the control laser um, also kind of comes in there. And uh, so here is one example uh, that we've already demonstrated with our system. And you, you can, this kind of goes back to the technology thing. Um, it's a quantum nonlinear filter. So suppose we take a coherent state of light, a state that's pretty easy to generate, and we send it into our Ripper EIT system. Well, what comes out is a single photon state. So basically, the two photon component, there will be absorption, will turn into one. The three photon component, absorption will turn into one, etc. And so, so really, um, if you want something like a single photon source, well, this is pretty great because you can send in a coherent state, and it just sort of absorbs away all the stuff you don't want, and it hands you back the stuff that you need. Right? And we are able to actually see uh, strong anti-bunching due to this physics. I mean, this is a paper that this was reported in. Um, so we uh, decided to extend this work to, to two different Rydberg states, and I'll explain why in a moment. But those states are, so, so we, we have the kind of same level scheme as before, but now we've added in this 99p3 half state. So the idea is that a photon is stored in 99p, right, and I just kind of marked that in green. And then we send in another photon coupled to this 100S. And so the photon stored in 99P doesn't go anywhere. It's not coupled to these lasers. So something in 99P is stored, and something in 100S is moving, right? And so this you know, stored guy is like a target. This moving one comes in, and they collide, right? And so this is kind of why we, why, I'll kind of tell you why we started looking into this. Um, and that's because in most of the river EIT work done so far, it's always been this kind of 100S, 100S, or, or two of the same Rydberg states interacting. And that is a Van der Waals interaction. It's a second-order dipole-dipole interaction. But 
100SN99P is a resonant dipole bipolar interaction. So that's intrinsically stronger than the Van der Waals interaction. So, so that part is interesting. So, uh, you know, I showed you this kind of picture of the two polaritons colliding. What is the naive expectation? Well, that would be that it's similar to this nonlinear filter, right? That, um, you know, there's this kind of strong level shift, there's really strong absorption, but we'd expect it to be even stronger because the dipole dipole interaction is strong. Um, but actually, so, so here's what we saw, right? Um, we, we measured the transmission of this, this kind of moving photon as a function of optical depth, so basically it's a function of the density of our atoms. And uh, you know, we kind of start to see the transmission drop. But then we saw something maybe unexpected at the time. Uh, the transmission increases with a function of this optical depth. Right? And as I said, in this naive expectation, it should just kind of plummet and hit the ground. But, but it actually increases. So here's the explanation for that. Um, the dipole-dipole interaction actually creates state exchange. So, so again, I have the, the, the stored excitation in 99P, the moving one in 100S. The moving one comes in, they swap states, and then the other one gets ejected. Right? So the excitations really swap states and they exchange rollers. The moving one becomes stored, the stored one becomes moving. And um, this can be mapped onto uh, you know, a, a Robby, you know, sort of a block, a block vector uh, picture really like a, very similar to, to atoms being driven by an electromagnetic field. And, and you can even write kind of the same, same state. So to say this is the input state, you know, S and a P, and then this is the one where they swap. And I can, I can write this down just like I would write the block vector equation. And I notice that there's, there's this factor of I, just like, just like with the block vector. Um, and, uh, and so that I is really, really a phase shift pi over two patient from the eye. Um, so when I've given this talk before, I've actually been asked numerous times about things related to the, the pulse uh, envelope and the fact that this is a, you know, infinitely narrow, infinitely large. Um, so, and I, I kind of always responded by like drawing pulses in the air with my hands and it just doesn't work. So I, I rendered a movie um, and I think this should Hopefully, yeah. So you have this pulse come in, they change places over some distance, and then the other one runs away. I'll just show you that again. This is the only picture you need to have with the pulse. Right? But there's this distance that's kind of that interaction range, and, and they swap they swap places kind of over the over the width of the pulses. Um, okay, so so that's all the physics. Let's prove it with some data. Um, so we take uh, two optical modes, they're spatially distinct, and we send it through this, this rubidium gas. Right? And these two modes are aligned to two separate detectors. And, uh, but they're also you know, focused within about a third of that exchange interaction range with each other. Right? So, so they sh they're coupled to these separate detectors, but photons in these two modes still should interact. And, uh, so basically, we prepare the stored excitation in one mode, we send the moving excitation in the other, and, and then we look at the cross correlations between these detectors. And what we find is actually uh, you know, a, a high correlation with sending the, the moving excitation in one mode and then seeing it hop to the other mode and come out in the other detector. Um, and, and sort of a, you know, the, the opposite kind of diminished correlation for, for the so, um, so that, that you know, is, is pretty strong evidence, I think, for this process even happening, um, but we can also characterize it. Particularly, we can, we can look into the phase. Um, so, so here are these uh, atoms again, and, and this is the setup. You know, we have our usual laser, our probe laser, and then we actually also add a second beam. This is kind of this probe split off and then added 160 megahertz to just to tune this laser. So that this beam doesn't interact with the gas, but then this one does. Right? So this one serves as a local oscillator. And then we look at the beat on a detector when this transmits, and we, we measure the phase shift of that beat. And that, that should give us the phase shift related to the interaction. Um, and so uh, here's that same transmission data that I, I showed you earlier. It's just plotted in uh, different colors. 
And uh, the theory curves uh, came from some uh, nice work done uh, with the collaboration of uh, Thomas Paul and, and his uh, graduate student. And um, basically, they were able to model our whole system, including kind of the density profile and, and all of the interesting effects with the with uh, numerical simulation. And so, uh, but alongside that, we also have phase data. Right? So, so here's the phase data. And we see that, that pi over 2 phase shift, that I phase shift, like I told you about before. Right? And so basically, you know, but one thing that's interesting is when the optical depth gets to a certain point, this phase saturates, right? It's, it's no longer, nothing is happening to it. It's, it's, it's pi over 2 and nothing changes, right? So it's not affected by the variability of the optical depth or, or the system density, however you want to talk about it. So this is really robust, right? And, and this is important because, because if the environment, you know, were to kind of the, the experimental environment were to fluctuate, it would couple to the system density, right? If, if the atom number fluctuated or cooling lasers would somehow fluctuate, something like that, it would couple to the system density. And the fact that this phase is insensitive to changes in the system density means that we have some kind of robust process on our hands. And so, um, and, and here's our, our paper uh, that recently came out, if you want to learn more about that. Um, so, so that robustness, you know, in hindsight we realize seems to suggest some type of protective behavior, like I was telling you before. And um, there's this uh, very beautiful, kind of simple model that, that Sumeron, um, one of Misha's theory students, um, who many of you may have met yesterday at the poster session, uh, came up with to describe to the kind of describe our system and describe this the symmetry protection. Um, so basically, we have our system dynamics described by uh, you know a Schrodinger equation. The uh, the psi here is the two two particle Hamiltonian, right? So R is like the coordinate of the moving polar ton, and, and R prime is the uh, coordinate of the stored one. And then uh, this is the Hamiltonian, it's the kinetic energy term. Then here's the interaction term, and there's a uh, there's an operator that causes these polarities to change points. And um, so so with this, we can define uh, you know a, a transmission coefficient of the whole whole medium based on these wave functions, right? Complex transmission coefficient where the amplitude gives you you know the intensity transmission, and the, the you know the argument gives you the phase. And um, so there's one more thing. Um, Consider something like this. It's called the chiral transformation. Um, as far as I'm aware, this isn't related to chiral molecules or chiral waveguides. It's just a separate use of the word chiral. Um, and, and it's just a, it's a mathematical transformation as defined in this way. And it turns out that, that this, you know, this model has chiral symmetry to it. So, so there's this chiral symmetry um, you know, related to this chiral transformation. And it turns out actually that, um, that you know something that, that Suman showed in the, the supplementary information in the paper <laughs> that you can actually take this chiral symmetry and you know a couple of other pretty fair and straightforward assumptions and actually derive this just from that just just from this kind of symmetry and so it's as if the symmetry itself is really kind of generating this phase this this pi over two phase and as long as that symmetry holds. Then you get then you get a robust phase, um, and you know as we can see this effect you know it gives you in this model high transmission and, and this pi over two phase and that that's interesting because that that pi over two phase that's something that can be used for you know a robust quantum gate with photons that's you know, controlled. Um, so so like I said the phase shift derives from the symmetry and and again because this is symmetry protected against these fluctuations that gives us this robustness against the you know fluctuations in the system parameters um, and that, that that kind of thing could potentially be useful for you know, some kind of some kind of protected quantum gate. Um, so uh, I'll just talk a little bit about so outlook um, some things in the yeah. So you, you don't get pi out experimentally so I mean pi? No we get pi over two. Oh pi over two, but it's not pi over two in this graph. So, so is it like that the model is only... No, 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 it's pi over 2. This, is, this phase is in units of pi. 
Yes, sure, sure. But there's a straight line, and the straight line is not strictly pivotal to the water. Am I missing? So, so what this is straight line, line, you're talking about this straight line, and these points don't completely agree with the straight line? No, no, no. That's the zero line, almost the yellow line. Oh, oh, because it, th there's some, you know, small error. I, I, let's see. So do, you to, do you want to tell me about all these details? Tell me what I'm on. I don't understand this better experiment in the bus system. What's that? Where's the experiment in robustness then? If you're not robust, I don't know. It's, it's robust because the phase doesn't change as a function of optical depth. What's that? I don't know. Yeah, high optical depth it is. It's just that different physics is occurring down here. Well, but the theory breaks down. That's the point of making this. Like, so, so I didn't, I didn't go into all the stuff going on. It's only true for high OD. It, it's all this theory is only true in the limit of infinite OD. Is that what you say? Larger. Larger. Okay, it's larger. But it's exponentially the same. It's right. Uh, it's exponential. The problems. But the dimension is exponentially small. Right. Exponentially small in OD. In one order. It's it's minus three hours. Yeah, it's exponential. The phase is exponential. The phase, yes, the phase. But, but is this stable to any other perturbation, whatever magnetic field, temperature? Uh, I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, <coughs> it's the topological protection is a strong word. It's a what? Topological protection is a strong word. Uh, no, it's symmetry protected. protected. Symmetry protected, not topologically protected. But symmetry protected. It's, it's, the same, it's the same symmetry which protects my parameter. Sure, but this, this also depends on if you have the model. Uh -huh. Depends on if you have the model right. Or not. It's the same as my bias. No one knows. What? 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 It's the same as my bias. I mean, this can also be a perturbation that breaks the, the symmetries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm just wondering. That's why. That's why there are no topological quantum computations. No, but I'm asking the same question. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The symmetry is only because it's uh, no, no, no. I the. Okay, so basically, this occurs. It occurs for large optical depths because there's other competing processes. So the whole model that I've showed you assumes that this um, the Van der Waals interaction dominates, but it doesn't dominate. There's or sorry, uh, the spin exchange interaction dominates. There's also a Van der Waals component, and if that is more dominant, then then this doesn't happen. So in this regime, that's more dominant. In this regime, the Van der Waals starts to take over. And then at some sufficiently large optical depth, the Van der Waals part doesn't matter anymore. And it's, it's purely this spin exchange process. And uh, you know, then Sunon's model holds, all of that holds. And then in the regime where Sunon's model doesn't hold, then you know, Tombas's model holds. Because it isn't included in all of these things. And So, um, so uh, one potential thing that we could consider is something like a double exchange. So, like um, you know, judicious use of microwave pulses, and uh, these polaritons could actually exchange once, and then they could exchange twice. And if they exchange twice, then they get a pi phase shift instead of pi over two, and this is also protected by symmetry. And that starts to sound a lot like the braiding of the topological quantum computer. So this is really analogous to something, something like photon braiding. Um, I don't know if we want to say whether it is braiding or isn't braiding, but it's, it's definitely analogous to braiding, at least. Um, and then something else like uh, many-body physics with light. So if we kind of think of a, a cross-section of our cloud, and say we put patterns of beams inside this cloud, you know, maybe we use a spatial light modulator or a mask or something. And uh, you know, say in all of these beams you have something like uh, you know, a photon coupled to this P state, and then you know, an S photon actually gets sent into the system, and then you can look at kind of the long-range dipole dipole interactions between you know these photons coupled to these kind of patterns of optical. Um, and then, you know, as Alexei mentioned, as also Aditya, my uh, lab mate, uh, has a poster on this. We, we recently saw this um, photonic trimer um, where we, we kind of measured the three photon correlations and phases of, of three photons in our system and uh, 
you know, compared with kind of a two-photon case, we can extract information about these things, the binding of the molecules, like I kind of uh, hinted at earlier uh, with, with G2 and G3 functions. And so with that, uh, I just want to thank my team. Uh, these are, so my advisor is Nisha Abladen, and then uh, my lab is the just Sergio as you, and then uh, former lab is Jeff, and then the uh, nice theory support we have from uh, Sunil Akhalas, and also uh, Daniel Visker, who's not on here, but that's uh, Thomas's uh, question. So yep, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the, the optical depth has less favorable scaling in the phase, um, but that... So, so just so I make sure I understand, so the, that means like 80% of the photons that end up in one mode swap with the other one? It, it means that that the swap happens 80% of the time and the other 20% suddenly is lost. So the photon actually is lost when you say... I guess that usually I would have thought that the limit would be like 50% or something. Like, don't you have to... It's the it's one. Right here, it's one. It's one. The limit So you can coherently control like interaction time and everything. So that well, it's it's controlled by the geometry. Space. It's controlled by the, the the one D part, right? So if it were, if it were two D or something, then then yeah, we have to worry about you know how long they spend next to each other. But the fact that it's one D means that they're always going to interact no matter what. And the interaction diverges. I mean, it's this huge ripple interaction. Right. So, I guess I'm thinking about like a rabbit. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the Robbie block vector, you know, that, that picture was simple, but it doesn't take into account things moving. Um, so it, it only works the that far when I, when I do the block vector. So the fact that they're moving means like, you know, you've got one here and kind of one stored, one moving, and then they go like this, but then the other one runs So it only goes halfway through the block, just because of the geometry. So it's been here then. So I want to come back to the same thing. So if, uh, if you show this view graph again, this, this is symmetry. Uh, uh, you have, uh, you assume linear dispersion. Uh, is it, do I see it right that uh, the, the quadratic dispersion part would break the symmetry, but if you go to extremely high optical depths, it's unimportant. That's the only point. I can make a comment on yeah. it. Uh, so that the effective Hamiltonian is in the central mass frame. So that you want the stored particle is propagating to negative and the propagating particle is propagating forward. So in that frame, I'm taking the limit of CW. So by definition, your quadratic term has to vanish. So I'm, I'm calculating the zero momentum uh, scattering amplitude for this particular exchange interactions. And that scattering amplitude has to be uh, purely imaginary by the symmetry of this interaction. Low energy theory. That's right. That's right. And it's connected if you have small optical benefits, you know, So uh, I was wondering about the, the scaling of the fidelity, not the phase. If you make a basically. Right. Uh, if you make a sort of linear dispersion argument shifted by a Rydberg interaction, you almost always come up with what seems like a reasonably fundamental square root OD dependence, and this does better than that. I was wondering if you had an intuition for what the benefit, why it does better. Why does it do better? Well, this is so the the transmission here is OD to the three halves. Right. Why does it do better? Then root OD is the question. Um, yeah, I guess it's this point that the, the radius increases up to our interaction. You can talk about the spokane values and so on. So the radius of the interaction. It's only, you think it's only the same? It's increasing with the OD itself, which we don't have like, from these shift arguments. Right? So it's not coming from the shift, it's coming from the time scale argument from the hopping from the 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 process. So it depends anyway, so it's going to work harder than the actual interest. And that's why it's scaling more quickly. Okay. So the shifts just don't happen anymore. So when, I mean, as soon as the model works, 
there are actually no shifts to further further continuous one. Right. It's kind of also in the Selling point to the symmetry protection is the OD scaling is actually better. Yeah. It's so much better. It's and, better. and for the phase, it's actually exponential. Phase is better, and I, you know, so you could also argue that, you know, the, you know, we said we had, you know, the symmetry protection being the, you know, transmission has still got some room for improvement in this, in this regime. But that's true. It scales better. Than Help the intuition a little bit. So this is an exchange interaction. That means it's always regiment. So unlike shifting energy, just changing. So every point in time as they approach, they regimentally flow, and this whole process stays regiment. So because of that, they happen farther than blockade, and also in some sense, you know, better. Okay. And in combination, the old, uh, scaling of transmission is higher. All right, let's think further together.